One of those guys is here to talk to you is uh, Jeff Tolberg. Uh, Jeff has worked on controlled traffic from the early 1980s. He's moving from energy aspects to crop, uh, soil and hydrology effects, and since retirement from the University of Queensland, he has been act an active member of, the, of ACTFA, contributing to a number of projects. He has just completed a four-year, $1.5 million Commonwealth government-funded project on soil emissions effects of CTF. So he's going to be talking on CTF reduces on in, in loss and emissions and energy. So thanks very much, Jeff. Thanks, Wes. Thanks, Wes. And uh, I should apologise for spoiling lunch for a lot of people and hurrying them up. Uh, yes, soil emissions of greenhouse gases and energy is what I'm talking about. But they're more popularly known as nitrogen loss through denitrification and fuel costs. So I should just acknowledge my co-authors from ACTFA and from the University of Southern Queensland and from the Queensland University of Technology who provided, if you like, the um, laboratory firepower of this project. But uh, greenhouse gas emissions, what we're talking about, we're talking about uh, nitrous oxide and methane and uh, they have global warming impacts of 328 times that of carbon dioxide, respectively. So nitrous oxide is uh, Australian cropping's biggest contributor to uh, global warming. Now, it, it is a significant lump of Australia's emissions, and it's emitted from wet soil, which is short of oxygen, anaerobic soil, soil where usually there's so much water in it, there's no room for the air to get in and uh, work along with the microbes. And when nitrogen and carbon are present, which is, uh, carbon's virtually always there in the no-till system, and the nitrogen you frequently add. Compacted wheel tracks remain wet and anaerobic longer, so they're the things that tend to emit nitrous oxide. And CTF should reduce it, by reducing the area of wheel tracks. Well, this was the basis of a project that ACTVA has done over the past four years, funded by the Department of Agriculture and Water Resources. It's the last hurrah of the previous government's climate change initiative. But uh, anyway, that's what we were doing. And we were demonstrating that CTF does reduce emissions by monitoring them from CTF grain crops. We were measuring emissions from CTF beds, non-wheeled soil, CTF traffic lanes, heavily wheeled soil, and those are things you find in any paddock that's been in CTF for a few years. We also needed to monitor emissions from soil which had had a single wheeling which one might regard as typical of what happens in a non-controlled traffic paddock. So it's just had one wheel over it, or one recent wheel, and we produced that by, in a CTF paddock, doing one run 50 metres along on a controlled traffic bed, and then just seeding it normally, at seeding time, then seeding it normally from the traffic lanes. Then we start measuring emissions, which is quite a difficult business. Uh, it's a question of pushing chamber bases, you can see one of them at the bottom right-hand side of that slide, into the soil immediately after seeding, and they stay there until the, not long before harvest. And you actually sample by taking head spaces, or elaborate lids if you like, putting them on these bases and uh, tying them down there, sealed down, and then just extracting samples of gas from there, uh, usually uh, four samples at half hour intervals. And that goes off to a chromatograph to determine the concentration of all these gases. And uh, it's the basis for calculating the rate at which soil's emitting it or absorbing it which is sort of all quite involved, and it's rather expensive. Uh, it was 
Uh, it costs the thick end of about $2,000 every time you do a sample. There's an awful lot of sampling involved. And the basis of this whole project was trying to demonstrate by looking across as many crops as we could. So we've me measured 15 crops over three years in paddocks from Toowoomba to Esperance, Horsham, Inverley, Swan Hill. We've, we hope, got a reasonable demonstration of uh, the Australian grains industry. And there, the photograph is just the chambers installed on Mark Wandel's farm near Esperance. They're a slightly different chamber. The principle's just the same. Now, you're supposed to sample every three days if you want an accurate assessment of what the emissions have been. Uh, if, within the budget that was provided for this, there's no way that could happen. We only did 14 samples on average per crop, so that meant every 10 or 12 days, which is okay. We can say with confidence what the ratio of emissions is between treatments. Our statements of what the actual quantity is are dubious. Uh, well, should we say not reliable? So, to show you just one set of actual results, this is nitrous oxide emissions from uh, Mark Mundell's barley in 2015. And the points are joined by straight lines, but they're meaningless. You know, they, they are just points. They're point measurements of the emissions at that time. The red ones, the random. The black one's the permanent lane. The green one is a controlled traffic bed. The main point of showing that slide is just to show how variable these things are. They're driven by rainfall, and they're driven by uh, nitrogen. And so you, know, you get a peak after seeding if some nitrogen has been applied, and a peak after um, top dressing. The thing that is that is concerning is that with a low frequency of sampling, we would tend to miss those big peaks. Uh, but we're also tending to sample more in the early part of the cropping season, so we're probably in the higher emission periods. Hopefully, the two things balanced out. The only other point I'd like to take from that side is that green, the control traffic bed, is consistently the least emissions, regardless. So let's have a look at what happens uh, cumulatively. This is just adding one reading to another over the full season. That's that same barley crop. And that control track bed always emits by far the least emissions. Uh, the random's always the biggest. Usually, the lane is somewhere in between. Not exclusively, though. Uh, in the following year, uh, in fact, the lane and the bed were similar. And that's a cause of some mystery which has been discussed with people like uh, Quentin Knight and, uh, of course, with, with Mark. Uh, the only likely explanation is that in that very wet year, uh, nitrogen was actually washed out of the permanent lane. But it is something we can't be sure of. You know, just as usual, random is nearly always the biggest, the bed's always the smallest, and that was a pattern repeated right across Australia. Now, the other thing that we monitored at the same time, um, mainly because once you put it through a gas chromatograph, you get the answer, was methane, which is another powerful greenhouse gas, but you know, it's a much greater concern to rice growers than it is to wheat growers. But just as a matter of interest, uh, again, Reliably, virtually throughout the country, beds always absorbed methane. A controlled traffic bed, soil in good condition, absorbs methane. Almost certainly the biolo biology in there is doing it. Random traffic and traffic lanes, they sometimes emit, sometimes absorb, but always the uh, permanent bed absorbed far more methane. So it's another small positive for the overall emissions effect. Now, to make sense of these, we simply look at the overall averages. And so I've summarized them there as the 
average total nitrous oxide nitrogen loss, the, nitrous ox the amount of nitrogen that was emitted as nitrous oxide, because that's the way we get the results. And throughout the southern region, which was nine sites altogether, uh, you can see over a, a season, we'd have 0.6 of a kilogram per hectare of uh, coming from the CTF beds, 1.4 from the random wheelings, the CTF lanes in between at one. Those figures in Esperance were about double that, approximately. And I imagine quite a lot of that was the very wet season in 2016, and we're only looking at two sets of results there. The southern region average is probably much more applicable to most of WA. Anyway, uh, when we remember that the thing that's reliable here is the ratio, what we can say quite certainly is that we're losing 2.4 times as much from a uh, random wheeling as from a controlled traffic bed. Again, obviously, the CTF lanes are somewhere in between. Probably depends on how much nitrogen there is in there. But that is the bit that we can actually, if you like, bank on. So if our current systems wheel on average or have compacted on average about 50% of the crop area uh, and a good CTF system is 12%, uh, with apologies, uh, then this would be a 30% reduction in the emissions, which is you know, all, all quite useful from a national point of view. Uh, but I can imagine that several of you are looking at those figures and saying 0.6, 1.4 kilograms of nitrogen, uh, uh, you know, so what? Um, in fact, of course, nitrous oxide is just one small component of total denitrification losses. And the Australian measurements of those losses, measuring the actual amount of nitrogen loss, is very difficult because the, the air is full of nitrogen. Uh, measuring any change in it, you just can't do it with those with emission measurements. <coughs> it's done by much more sophisticated ionic labelling systems. But it's been, the figures have been between 10 and 70 times those figures we mentioned. So uh, 0.6 of a kilogram per hectare means at least 6 kilograms per hectare lost from a CTF bed, and at least 14 from a random wheeling. And in the Esperance area, roughly double that. And in fact, you know, the chances are the figure's quite a lot bigger than that. So the thing we can say is that there, while there are many reasons why CTF might improve nitrogen efficiency, and Quentin's been over several of these this morning, this is hard evidence of one more positive and uh, well, it is just another positive. From a climate change point of view, which is what we were funded for after all, uh, in terms of kilograms of CO2 equivalent, adding up the effects of the nitrous oxide and the methane, then we're looking at 190 kilograms per hectare from a bed and at the other end of the scale, 460 from a random wheeling as the southern region average. And again, that means a useful effect uh, for, in terms of overall emissions if you put it over enough hectares, of course. Oh, wrong way. Now, those figures, the specific figures, as I mentioned earlier, they are dodgy. People would say... <laughs> that the only thing that is really reliable here is the ratios, but then you can take those ratios and apply them to the figures that are used in Australia's national greenhouse accounts, and you end up with pretty similar figures. So I reckon they're about right. Anyway, 
Summarising it, wheel tracks virtually double, more than double greenhouse gas emissions and nitrogen loss. CTF will reduce those losses by about 30%, probably more if we can keep nitrogen out of tram lines. The absolute quantities, perhaps 1 to 200 kilograms of kilograms CO2 equivalent per hectare and anything from 3 to 16 kilograms of nitrogen. But briefly to another topic, which is another project, which is the uh, GRDC project on CTF adoption in the southern low rainfall zone run by Chris Blewett. Uh, and the reason I was talking about it is, this, although this is a fairly large project and it's got some, we've got a poster on the project which I'd recommend you have a look at over this afternoon's smoker or this evening. Uh, we're looking at a major research activity with replicated research sites running from Minipa right through to Condoblin, spread out over the, the Mali area, essentially, and a bunch of on-farm, what we label development activities with the farm systems groups, uh, where they've had speakers. We're doing things like wheel track yield effects, uh, wind erosion in wheel tracks, which is a concern in some parts of the world, and the energy bit, which is the other thing I was talk about here. And energy, in other words, fuel use effects, we provided support for USQ, that's Toowoomba, University of Southern Queens, Toowoomba PhD students, to assess wheel traffic effects on cedar draft and rolling resistance in southern region loams and sands. And uh, there's a student busy trying to get his equipment set up, a unit to measure the draft force on four individual shanks, which could have different things fitted to them and could be run, you know, two in wheel tracks and two uh, not in wheel tracks. And the other thing they used was a simple drawbar pull meter to measure how much effort is required to tow equipment around the paddock, which is a remarkably big proportion of our fuel use. So that's rolling resistance or motion resistance. And they were assessed on four farms in Victoria and South Australia by two of our students, Adnan Luhaib and Mahmoud Hussein, and they also have a couple of posters, one on the energy work and one on some nitrogen work in uh, that, the nitrogen work, I'm afraid, that's in clay soils. That's not, can't claim to be southern region. But uh, I'd recommend those posters to you. But summarising their results in broad average terms, and I, I, I'm just doing virtually an eyeball effect on their results, in loams and sands, the draft effect of a wheel track, the draft impact of working a wheel track as opposed to non-wheel soil is only about 5% according to their measurements, which seemed to me, as somebody who worked on this uh, 20 years ago, uh, to be very small. The rolling resistance effect, though, the additional effort required just to move a tractor around, and this included both wheel tractors and rubber track tractors, was 40%, you know, going from a uh, wheel track to a non-wheel track increases the effort required by 40%. Now, I guess the interesting thing here is that to compare that with the northern region results, uh, which they also did, and, uh, you know, in clays, the draft effect was over, well over 30%. My figures from ages ago would put even more than that. The rolling resistance effect was smaller. And I thought that's interesting, particularly because in no-till, more of your fuel is being used just driving stuff around the paddock than is being used, well, certainly in so soil disturbance in uh, a cedar. So if one factors that into the sort of data we've got available from the departments on average fuel use, 
It amounts to about five litres per hectare over a no-till crop season. I don't know whether people would say that's a, a, too big or too small, but that's the figure that one gets working from the figures that are available. Anyway, so the summary is exactly the same as before, but we can add to it that less fuel, and that's another reduction in both costs and in CO2 emissions. And when you look at those two things, as occurs so often when you look in the longer term, what's good for the environment turns out to be pretty good for productivity as well. So thank you very much. And can I also just say I should thank all the people who helped with that work, the cast of thousands, the of thousands involved. And the other comment I'd like to make is uh, people have very generously mentioned ACFA's conference. Most of the work of this conference was put in by the WADFA team. And I'm sure the ACFA executive would like to thank them for that, as you know, Dave and Graham and Bindi and Paul, they put in most of the work. Those are so recent and do very much. Thanks, Jeff. Congratulations. Thanks very much, Jeff. And uh, Jeff, I thought you did pretty well uh, standing up to the ready to get their glasses on. Didn't you? <laughs> uh, okay, any questions? I've got one. Uh, why didn't you measure nitrous oxide emissions in summertime? Because the work we've seen is. Uh, because essentially our object was to show a ratio you know, we had to demonstrate there was a real effect and on the basis that you know, if we can demonstrate there is a real effect well perhaps somebody might look at it more seriously because this is something that's been obvious since the late 1990s but nobody's been willing to look at it so that's what we went to. and over summertime you know with uh, we've looked at it over summer cropping in Queensland but you know, there we've got very uh, storm rainfall, so the business of missing peaks is really important there. And we'd have, yeah, you know, uh, summer crops show less rain, sorry, less emissions than the winter crops. Whereas, in fact, the proper work that's been done with frequent sampling would show the reverse. Economics. <laughs>